Mayor, we are recording. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. It's um, Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. It's uh, 5.01 p.m., and this is the city of Cotwood Heights. This is our work session, and we'll begin by reviewing the business meeting agenda. Hopefully everyone has a copy of that. Uh, after the welcome and pledge, we will have uh, Tim read in any public comments we have that uh, have been sent to us by five o'clock tonight. Um, uh, the, we have two standing quarterly reports. Uh, we have our UFA report from uh, Chief Riley Pilgrim. Riley, welcome. Uh, saw you yesterday morning as well. Yeah. And then we have our public works report uh, from Matt Ship. So Matt will be doing that. I think we have uh, two action items prior to the consent calendar. Uh, the first is a resolution approving an exception to a private roadway. Uh, Matt, do you want, I mean, not Matt, I guess, uh, uh, Mike, do you want to talk about that real quickly? Uh, I, I can now. It's also on our work session agenda. Okay, that's right. I, I thought it was. That's why I hesitate. Let's, we'll, we'll talk about it during the work session. I think it's pretty straightforward, yeah. The second action item is uh, a construction contract with uh, Newman Construction for Scotty's Drive. And... Uh, And I think that's also on the work session, so we'll talk about that then as well. Okay, with that being said, we'll go back to the uh, work session agenda and we'll turn over to uh, Scott and Tim to talk about the tentative budget. There's a couple minor tweaks that have uh, been proposed uh, since we talked about it last. So, uh, Tim, Scott. I, I will start into that and then let Scott give the specifics on this. Uh, just to let you know, we are in the process. We'll, we scheduled the meeting for a public hearing on June 2nd to hold the hearing on this tentative budget. Obviously, adoption will be uh, two weeks later on, I believe, the 16th of June. So that is the process. Tonight, uh, we have really in the packet the same information that was provided uh, last time that we met. It's the tentative budget that's out for public comment. Uh, we haven't received any public comments that I'm aware of yet. We do have a, a couple of changes that Scott will share that we found out about related to Unified Fire. We also have some updates on some sales tax figures that came in for the month of March that we'll share as well as a couple of other items. And then if there's any comments or questions or things that you want to talk about, we can do that at, at that time. So Scott, if you want to just share those brief updates. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. So we um, got an update after UFA had their last meeting. Um, I think it was last week um, that shows that their increase instead of being um, <clears throat> we had in our budget $100,898 and it will now only be 81,556. So that's a savings of 19,342 over what we had in the tentative budget excuse me, so that is a, a, a good swing of that. Um, uh, can, I, can I interject there with, mm -hmm. I, th I think it's important uh, being on the UFA board that uh, uh, we, we, we note at this time the efforts by Chief Peterson and the Finance Committee uh, as a Finance Committee member, and uh, I think Riley, you were involved in that discussion. Uh, each department of UFA presented their budgets to the Finance Committee, and we each had an opportunity to critique, and many of those uh, uh, department heads proposed areas where they could reduce. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Pilgrim himself had a, a reduction, if I remember, about 40,000 in travel and training, and so the result of that is what we're seeing today in our budget is savings uh, going forward. So uh, Riley, please send our appreciation to Chief Peterson for those efforts. It was, it was quite impressive. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, that's all of the changes that affect the um, budget itself. We don't ha yet have um, updated 
uh, property tax numbers that will come in maybe three weeks or so here, two and a half if we're lucky. Um, <clears throat> but we do have, we, we got preliminary numbers on our March sales tax. And I don't know the process that they do at the sales tax commission, but basically then they gave us a number and said it could change from that. So take it for what it is. They don't usually give us preliminary numbers. But when they gave us the preliminary numbers, if that was to hold and come forward, then at the end of March, now remember this is March that we're talking about, we would be uh, still 5,000 ahead of where we, would, where we had predicted that it would go um, if that were to hold true um, for year to date through March. Uh, again, we don't know April. April is the big month where we're there, you know, we're probably expecting to see the, the lowest amount of sales tax, but that one, we won't have that for about another month. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the other item that we received is we received the final payment on Class C roads that we um, book into our budget for the current year. The amount that came in um, put us on a year at a, an annual amount of 1290000 on a budget of 1240000 So that puts us 50000 ahead of our budget and 50000 ahead of what I predicted the uh, projection would be. That being said, so we have, we're 50000 ahead net in our Class C roads funds. So if sales tax were to be affected at a higher rate than what we're anticipating, it kind of gives us 50000 of cushion um, on that. If sales taxes come in about where we predicted that it would be, then we would be 50,000 over um, with, between those two revenues and we'll just have to kind of keep our eye on all the revenues in total. But that's good news on the Class C roads uh, revenues for that time period. So just wanted to give you those two updates that I'm aware of at this point in time. So Tim, Scott, you're on, I, under, you're on yeah, I understood you what you're saying was about uh, 50,000 up with Class C, uh, another 19 or so positive with what UFA was able to do, and then sales tax wasn't terribly impacted in March, but we certainly need to see how it's going to be in April going forward. Yeah, but they're, they're for different years. The fire is for the next budget year. The sales tax revenue and the Class C roads is for our current budget year, so they're, they're a little bit of a a mix of two uh, years there, but yeah, that's correct. Okay, thanks. Scott, it's my understanding that the the savings or the lesser amount for UFA will incorporate the new number in our budget coming forth. Yes, exactly. When we present the final budget to be adopted, we will include that lower number, so it will reflect that $19,000 of savings um, the other item that we're currently waiting on that we know we'll have a bit of a change on will be that property tax number when we get the final certified property tax and the, and the, the rate that goes along with that. Mayor, that's all we have to share as far as uh, cha changes or new items and we can talk about anything on the budget if you would like. I have one thing I'd like to bring up and everyone can listen and if you think of a question, I think it's important to note uh, it's on page, I think, I can't which page is, when we, we talk about the fund balance um, going forward after this, at the, at the end of the next budget. Uh, if I understand correctly, Scott, we're taking about $1.2 million from our fund balance to prepare our 2020-21 budget, which will leave about Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars available for the next seven fifty three right there for the next budget year, which is twenty twenty one twenty twenty two yeah if that were if that were the case, if we were going to carry forth the same budget level, we would be we would not have sufficient funds. is that correct? That is an accurate projection, yes. Because we're using about a million three forty, so yep. we're using roughly double what would be available um, at the end of that year uh, moving forward. You're correct. So, as a council, 
is we look forward to the next fiscal year, not the one coming up, but the next one, uh, a year from now, that's, that's, a, that's a heavy lift right there. That's a challenge. So we'll have to start looking at ways to mitigate that lack of uh, funds. Yeah. Mayor, this is uh, Council Member Michael. I I think that that's what I was trying to allude to in our parting comments last week, I, yeah. two weeks ago. If you recall, what's most important, I think, to all of us is maintaining the quality and level of staff that we have. Um, but my point when I mentioned that was, that's a kind of a that, that's a, that that number causes all great concern. So yeah. I just for the record, wanted to. I, I don't know that I explained it very well, so thanks for articulating it better. No, I, I think that's that's important, and that's why I bring it up again. I think it becomes very clear, and uh, so it'll be something I don't think we'll wait a year from now to try and uh, find a solution. Hopefully, sales tax revenues and some other revenue comes in to help mitigate that, but there's something we're going to have to look at, I think, as a council. So uh, let's keep that in mind. But, um, oh, I, I, I agree with that very much. One of the things that... Uh we discussed with the with the budget committee was making sure we were looking at the details over the next few months um, and making sure it's a lot easier to make an adjustment halfway through the year on January 1 than it is to wait until the very end and have to make a much larger one. Um, I mean, the 750 is just slightly less than, you know, the last uh, the property tax uh, increase that we did a couple of years ago for, I mean, for reference for someone who's listening, but uh, yeah, I think our, we're gonna have to have some very serious budget discussions in September and October. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, one other question for Scott, where is, we, where do we budget? I, it's probably real right in front of me, I can't see it. Where do we budget the 557,000 for PTO? Um, we don't budget that. That's a reserve, kind of like a liability. It's something that's due and payable in the future, but it's measurable at, as of uh, the June 30th of each year. Okay. And so that's not uh, that's not budgeted as, a, as necessarily a payout. The expense is not budgeted in um, our budget. That's just a, it's a liability that we have to reserve and the offset to the liability is a reserve and fund balance. So do we have a history of that liability, how it how it's changed, has it's grown, or what's the formula? I um, some, point, some point in time, I think the council needs to understand what that formula is. Yeah, so the, um, within the policy uh, book, the personnel policy, it shows you how much, um, whether it's PTO or, sick or uh, vacation time, depending on um, your status with the city, um, you earn at a certain rate. Um, for, and, I, and I don't have, to have that right in front of me, so I can't quote it, but um, there are certain periods where you earn at a certain rate, then you graduate to a little higher rate, then you finally graduate to the final um, earning level um, at some point in time. I think it goes over a 16 year period. So by the time you hit your 16 years of seniority, you're, you're earning at the highest rate. Yeah. Um, uniquely enough, we're right about that 16 year period in the um, duration of the city so we're starting to come into, um, if you will, the mature level of our city in terms of employees across the board and everything along those lines. Um, and then the police are just a teeny bit behind that because they started just a few years after the city started. So um, as we get um, more employees across that whole spectrum, then that will, will go out. But how it works is if you have an hour of, of PTO or vacation, what have you, you take that times the uh, pay rate. So if it was $10 an hour, it would be $10 that you would reserve for that. And then um, there's also a, a, a little bit of a reduction on the PTO side uh, where you don't get to cash out all of it. If you had 100 hours, you only can cash out certain amounts of hours depending on how many years of service that you have with uh, the city. And so all that's taken into account. Um, so it grosses up first and then it, it grosses back down in, in certain instances uh, when it's PTO related. And then that amount, whatever that is, if you will, the vested amount that we have um, in terms of uh, paid time off or vacation, we reserve that on our books because if, if, if on you know, July 1st, 
we were to um, close close the city and not do anything anymore, we would need to pay that out at that point in time. And so that's the that's the uh, theory, I guess, and, and the accounting standard that kind of goes with that is that we, yeah. we are funded for our, our liabilities. We well, won't spend a lot of time on it, but I think it's something that as, as a member of the council, I want to better understand because if it's not budgeted, therefore we don't have any expenses each year out of that account, rather out of that restriction. Well, amount. you could, if you had a lot of turnover or if you had a change in your workforce, say you went from 100 employees to 50 employees, then you would incur a direct expenditure, you know, that would be related to that. And so, and, and then it depends on what you do in terms of, uh, you know, ongoing and stuff. Oftentimes, though, we won't incur a direct expenditure with that. However, from an accounting standard, we have to reserve that because it says the measurement date is, you know, June 30th of each year. And so what's on the books at that point in time in terms of um, a paid time off and, and what have you that's been um, promise to employees and then we book that on as a liability and, and, and move that through according to you know accounting yeah. standards and things. Well I'll have some more questions later I just I just wanted to kind of break the ice and I would like to better understand that going forward. The other question and uh, I'm sorry Mayor may I interrupt I, I, I have um, I brought up some of these questions during um, our budget subcommittee and uh, Tim I think I had asked you for some of the information that the mayor had just uh, mentioned is it possible if, if I could be a second to the mayor's request can we take a, a deeper look at this I, I I'd just be curious that it seems like annually when when a staff member leaves there's enough money to pay it out and so it hasn't it doesn't appear that it's hitting the liability I mean maybe that's what the mayor's getting at but I, I would just I'd be like I'd be interested to just take a deeper dive at, at this topic yeah we yeah knowledge. we can I can get with Paula and Scott. We we preliminarily looked at those numbers and, and can kind of show over time where they're at. A lot of times, as Scott alluded to, uh, we don't have to incur that expense. Uh, therefore, it's not budgeted because we there's usually a delay in when you hire someone anyway after a position, after a person leaves. And oftentimes, that's what covers this. A lot of times that's the practice with doing this, but we do have to have that reserve in place to cover that uh, liability. But yes, we, we can put together some numbers and I can get that to you. Well, we don't want to spend, yeah, thank you, Christine. I, that, that's a, a valid uh, question that you raised and I know you've raised it before. I think the other thing we'll want to look at going forward will be the uh, these uh, RDA accounts. I think we've got that scheduled in a month or two, but Again, my point with this budget, though it's tentative, I think we'll want to review everything going forward because when we look at that $753,000 number, that will not be sufficient to meet uh, expenses going forward in the next fiscal year. Uh, now, there'll be some other variables, I'm sure, that will impact that. And, you know, the big one will be sales tax and things like that. But uh, uh, we also have... Uh, an understanding of a, a desire to uh, appropriately pay our employees with colas and merits and those things. So uh, I think the budget discussions will be a big part of our agendas going forward as we look to mitigate this and have a plan well before a year from now. So Anyway, a couple comments and thoughts as I've, I've been looking at this. Any any other comments, thoughts, questions regarding the tenancy budget before we move ahead? Hearing none, uh, uh, do we note those comments? And let's talk about fireworks restrictions. Uh, uh, we'll turn over to, I guess, uh, Chief Pilgrim. It's uh, I think we're all aware of, of the tragedy that hit our city a couple of years back uh, uh, near the cemetery where we came close to losing a home. And so we have worked closely with UFA in maximizing areas where we legitimately can limit the uh, setting off of fireworks. So Riley, go ahead. Okay, so um, what we have is we, we took the 
information from last year and the previous years, and we had no recommended significant changes to the map. And I can show you that on my screen here. Let's see here. You can give us my best. Yeah, each council member may want to be looking at their district and seeing if there's any area that's of concern. Yeah. So in the, the, the neat thing about Collin Heights too, you guys also have a really good map that highlights your, your districts as well. Um, that's really user friendly. So what you'll see is we stuck with what we originally had done, a lot of the fringes of the city that we would classify as an urban interface. Um, this too is in line with the state of Utah's wildfire risk assessment. Um, so a lot of the firework restrictions you'll see throughout Collinwood Heights line up with the state of Utah's recommendations when they classify wildfire risk. Um, you'll see most of the open areas or areas where we have problems getting to fires like along the 215 corridor. Um, you know, some of these other streets which have proven challenging sometimes to get into in a timely manner just because of location. So we feel pretty confident based off of what we saw last year. Um, we didn't have really any too many significant problems around the valley, let alone in Conwood Heights um, with fireworks. Our, our concern this year is with the cancellation of a lot of the municipal fireworks shows and other things, we, we are fully aware and concerned the fact that many citizens are probably gonna probably spend more and do more fireworks on their own. So we'll work closely with, you know, the, with the police department and make sure we have a pretty active uh, response for that night. We, we typically do a pretty good job at bolstering our resources and partnering up with, you know, our law enforcement part or agencies. So we'll do what we can there. But I don't know if you guys have any questions or concerns as far as areas. What, what we have in place is pretty final. If there's any extended circumstances, or changes that you'd like to see the map, we can request those through our fire marshal. Um, they, they want to have this map published by June 1st. So anything that we would have to do would have to be pretty immediate. Um, and we, we can probably push that through. They're giving a little bit of leniency due to the, the COVID situation. But I don't know, Tim, if you have any thoughts on this, but this is kind of what we had from last year. Not a lot, not, not any changes that I'm aware of, so. Yeah, and if I just would add, you remember we had some comments. We had originally reviewed this and then had some public comments um, after we'd originally reviewed the map and we added some areas. And anyway, they are included in this as well. So if you have any additions, um, we'd, we'd love your input tonight. Otherwise this will stand and it will be the final uh, map at this point. Um, uh, what I'm looking at looks good. Um, if Riley, if you don't maybe might mind making a note for next year, possibly. Um, there is an area, it's down uh, on Denmark Drive, Danish Oaks, that area, the new yep. subdivision is going in. It has been kind of open wildland, but it's currently being built out as standard residences. And so um, either next year or the following year, that particular area probably should go back and be reflected as all the other residents, residential areas in the city. Right now it's red and it's still under construction. So I think that's appropriate, but it'll, it's a place to look at uh, going forward. Okay, I made a note of that one. And I have a question also, if I can. Crestwood Park, I know it's a county park, and they go through and they mow that down. Uh, I don't know how they do that as far as timing, uh, but that's pretty important because that uh, wild wheatgrass grows pretty quick, and then once it gets that uh, white color, I mean, it's, it's pretty tender dry. And yeah, so it just, oh, go ahead. Oh, I apologize, no, go ahead, you, you can finish. Oh, I was just gonna say, it's, uh, it has had fires we know in the past, and Riley, I don't know if you remember or have any history of that, where it does go up the hill. When it goes up the hill, it burns really quickly. We've had a lot of neighbors on the hill that will throw their clippings and different things over the hill, so that's a concern sometimes. Uh, sometimes they think it keeps the, the uh, tall wheatgrass from growing, and, and so I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but. It is a concern down in, in that area. It's probably one of the bigger wooded areas that there may or may not be an issue as far as. Uh, Godfrey, as, as 
for your information, if you look at this map where it's, where it's uh, uh, enlarged right now, you'll notice up on top on Park Ridge where you're referring to that we've expanded the red area all the way across the street. So you cannot have fireworks even near the rim. And this is something that uh, Councilman Shelton really uh, uh, pushed last year was to expand those areas. So it's not just the park itself, it's even going outside. I can't remember what the statute is. It's like 200 feet or something like that, or 400 feet, I don't know. Yeah, 200. Yeah. yeah I've I'm, I'm relatively very, actually very familiar with Crestwood Park. I've both fought fire there and mowed that grass myself. So yeah, it's quite the experience, but uh, yeah, the, the, um, it is good and bad. You know, they throw that mulch over there, which kind of compresses that grass, but their grass will burn as well. And it's a little bit of a slower smoldering fire, but it's just, it's, it takes work to put all that out. And so we can reach out to our County partners and just see what their plan is on, on, trimming that area but yeah that that's definitely on my radar is uh, as a matter of fact this area where we had that previous fire um off the cemetery those are two just areas that stand out to me is where people kind of they're, they're aware of the boundaries i think but it's, it just takes one errant firework to go that direction so we'll, we'll definitely be aggressive in patrolling and monitoring that area and I'll, I'll follow up with them to see if that's something they can get on before the before july so I was just going to mention the uh, we've had trucks try to come down and enter from the east on our little tiny lane, but really the only way to get into that park is through the uh, where the swimming pool area is and the bridge is there. Yeah. And so it makes it a little bit tough to get to uh, quickly. Sometimes you have to go around, but you can once you get in there, you can drive the smaller trucks right in there. I'll, I'll be sure to communicate that especially the crews who are working the 4th of July. We're, we're pretty familiar. If you've worked in Conwood Heights, you're very familiar with Siesta Drive and the intricacies and the dead ends and kind of the tricky parts of getting in there. So I'll, I'll make it a personal priority to visit with the battalion chief over that area and just be sure the crews who are going in are very familiar with access and some of the challenges that we've experienced in there. So... And we've got a little bit of issue on our hill in our association where we need to get, uh, maybe we need to rent some goats or something. But uh, we've got quite a bit of that wheat grass that grows uh, to the north of our development and goes along Highland Drive. Uh, okay. That We need to probably watch that because sometimes the people in apartments in Pinnacle will, will blast off their fireworks and I'm always on edge and driving back and forth trying to make sure if something catches we catch it quick enough yeah we have several hillsides like that through our whole city yeah and uh, those are all we reviewed those as a council uh, last couple of years and I think they're all in red now uh, you know it's old Wasatch Boulevard it's uh, it's in district three tallies district with uh, the uh, uh, old mill area and yeah so we've got a lot of those and I, I think this map is, is, is well done. I think we've worked on it the last couple of years. And so with, with Scott's uh, reminder for next year, I, I personally think it's excellent. And with those comments made with Crestwood and Access uh, and uh, the uh, cemetery property, those sensitive areas, I, 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 think it's, I think it's great. So we just want to make sure the council could see it. And if you had anything specific in your district, you could share it with us. Yeah. yeah and I'm, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, with, with my comment previously, maybe um, Tim or Mike Johnson, as they go through, if there are any developments that are occurring, you know, like this one where we're actually now build, building uh, single-family homes on previously kind of open space, um, you know, maybe at least we get that communicated through to Riley sometime during the year when that's completed so we can make the adjustments to this map just kind of as a, reg as a policy once a year have that reviewed where any new, new developments have gone, just gone in just to make sure that the map's accurate. We can do that. And then if, if concerns come up over the next few weeks that we don't talk about tonight, feel free to share those with Tim or myself. And I, I'm happy to pass that on to the, the individuals, individuals who'll be working those, af those afternoons and evenings. Um, well, I say if you if you work in Collin Heights, you're very familiar with some of those kind of trickier, hard to access areas. 
that require a little more thought before you go driving in there. So I'm happy to, if you have any concerns personally, we'll, we'll be sure to follow up on those. So. All right. Thank you very much comments. Uh, uh, I think we'll move ahead on the agenda now. And uh, uh, we have a Wasatch Boulevard corridor agreement uh, that we're, we're looking at. Uh, Mike Johnson, you want to present that? This is a different difference than the uh, EIS study. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'll provide a little context and what we're after tonight. And then I'll, I'll just want to spend some time and go through the, the draft corridor agreement that we have received from UDOT and have added some of our comments to. Um, but the intent tonight is to present this to you, summarize what it is, what it does and what it doesn't do, um, hear your concerns, your feedback, your questions, and then pass those back along to UDOT um, and, and get answers on those before we bring it back and, and consider this in any formal manner. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna pull up the, the corridor agreement. This is also in your council packet. Uh, let's see. Apologize for finding here. Is that showing up okay? Is that the the staff memo? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, so, so this is the staff memo. I won't reread this, but, but I, I do wanna focus on some of the areas I've highlighted. Obviously, these are not the only areas we can discuss, but, but the ones I think will um, get us to the bottom of what this is, what it does, and, and kind of summarize the, the benefits of this. Um, so UDOT approached us probably, probably about a year ago. Um, this was not the EIS team. This was the traffic division within region two. Uh, that approached us about this. Um, so this is a, a little bit separate than the EIS and it's not the same type of planning document or planning study in, in the way the EIS is. This is more of an access management um, document. It's an agreement, but many of the, the things you'll read in here, the, the provisions or the guidelines in place on UDOT side are already in place. Um, they have a code for access management, um, intersection spacing, um, you know, driveway standards, things like that uh, for their state highways already. This just makes the city more aware of that code. And, and this also seeks to incorporate any provisions of city master plans or general plans or studies uh, that are applicable to make UDOT aware of city studies as well. Um, so, so I will just quickly summarize the, the first three um, recitals here on this document. The, the intent here is to preserve a corridor and establish a traffic signal plan and access control plan along SR 190 and SR 210, so Wasatch Boulevard, through Cottonwood Heights. Um, the, again, the purpose of the agreement is to ensure future collaboration between UDOT and the city, uh, facilitate traffic flow for all modes of transportation, so that's not just vehicles, that's transit, that's pedestrians, that's cyclists. Um, to be in accordance with local jurisdictions, current transportation master plans, corridor plans, or general plans. So that would be the Wasatch Boulevard master plan. And to be in accordance with UDOT's current access management standards. Uh, finally, the, oh, is there someone? Okay. Um, finally, the, the, the agreement um, benefits both UDOT and the city because as as staff and, and leadership changes over time, the agreement will be in place to make sure that both parties are aware of the other's uh, goals and visions and standards uh, along the corridor. Um, so that, that gives you a, a sense of what it is. Um, I'd say what, what this is not intended to be is, is anything that supersedes the work we've been doing with UDOT um, in terms of trying to uh, you know, promote slower speeds on Wasatch Boulevard, look at um, capacity in, in a transit oriented way to push um, public transit along the corridor rather than just vehicular traffic. It, it's not really uh, applicable to those types of things that will be handled through the EIS and we certainly will continue to push those things. And those are stressed strongly in the Wasatch Boulevard master plan, which we, we continue to strongly stand behind. This really seeks uh, to provide a tool to the city as, um, you know, as Prospective developers come in or projects are proposed that need access onto Wasatch Boulevard to, to give us an understanding of 
you know, what those developers will be up against when they, when they propose access, what standards they need to be aware of, uh, what city standards are in place that we want to make UDOT aware of as uh, permitting processes are, are um, undertaken. Um, the corridor preservation section here just states that um, SR190 and SR210 are classified as, as category three and category five facilities. Those are defined in this, uh, this R930-6 document. I've read through this document, it's about 60 pages long or, or, or more, and, and it really is a very technical document that details the, the types of intersections and the, the intersection spacing and which areas warrant traffic signals and, and that kind of level of detail. It doesn't touch a lot on required speeds or the number of lanes or capacity or anything like that. I looked closely for those things. So this really is an access management document, but th what this provision does is provide the city a method to, um, you know, to submit a petition to change the classification of those roadways if there are valid findings, establishes a process for that. Um, and it also reaffirms the classification of SR190, which is Wasatch in front of the gravel pit and then up Big Cottonwood Canyon. And then SR210, which uh, is Wasatch Boulevard from Fort Union Boulevard down to Little Cottonwood Canyon. Uh, and then we kind of get into the technical details of this. And, and like I said, a lot of this information is found within that existing, uh, that R930-6 document that UDOT uses uh, for access management on their, um, their state highways. But this just puts it in writing. Um, this provides the general um, signal spacing and street spacing and driveway spacing standards. Uh, you can see for the category three, which is the, the a higher capacity road, which would be in front of the gravel pit, you know, it, it discourages or prohibits things like private driveways from direct access. Uh, category five, which is the rest of Wasatch, does allow it, but there are a lot of provisions and restrictions in place. Um, so I will quickly go through the rest of these things and, and just provide you the summary. Um, just states here that UDOT, as part of this agreement, requires the following conditions um, be met and maintained. Uh, so offsetting of existing and future streets is not allowed. So if you have street or driveway or, or you know, local access points on opposite sides of Wasatch Boulevard, they, they need to be lined up. If they're not, they create um, site distance and uh, intersection challenges, visibility challenges. Um, I think Kings Hill Drive uh, in its current uh, layout today is, is a good example of this type of provision and, and why it's important. If there is any variation, um, the skew of those access points should be no greater than 15 degrees. So there is a little wiggle room there. Uh, B here states that every effort possible should be made for existing non-street accesses onto um, Wasatch Boulevard. So this would be private driveways directly onto the corridor to be combined and access made to internal roadway systems in the development. So limiting direct access onto Wasatch Boulevard. And our Wasatch Boulevard master plan uh, contains a lot of these recommendations as well. Uh, you don't want a lot of conflict points on a, on a highway. You want local access. It, it, it provides better traffic circulation, better safety, um, and, and better traffic flow on the actual corridor. Mike, Mike are you, yeah. the screen sharing that you have only has the cover memo. Are you going through this? Oh yeah, I apologize. Um, yeah. Oh, it said it was paused. Let's see, resume. Yeah, I have, I had, I have my own copy in front of me. That's why I was going through with you. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So I, I just read A and B, and I was just on C. I apologize. Hmm. Um, C here states that if existing UDOT roadway rights of way, including easements, are proposed to be used by new developments uh, to construct acceleration or deceleration lanes, um, so local access or or uh, really uh, lanes to, to accommodate a safe merge into the highway, um, that if they are proposing to use existing UDOT right-of-way, that, that may be okay, but they would need to dedicate additional right-of-way to UDOT. Again, this is a requirement that already exists today um, on UDOT. It's just providing that information in writing here. Hey, Mike, I, I yeah. have a question, question on this. As it relates to maybe uh, uh, an example that occurred at the, um, um, 
the development near um, in district for G Vernet. Mm -hmm. um, so did they did they have to acquire more right of way and then pay for the acquisition of that right of way and then also pay? For, does the developer pay? I would assume for the acceleration and the deceleration lanes. Uh, in general, yes. Giverne was a little different because that that's actually the city owned yeah. Los yeah. Boulevard there. But but yeah, in Giverne's uh, the example of Giverne, they did have to add additional capacity uh, to that right of way, and that was at their cost. So there was some dedication and some roadway improvements at their cost. Is it, is there anything we need to do to tighten this up to make sure that the developer knows that they'll have to, you know, that the onus of any kind of expenditures is on them and not us, I guess it's known, but. I, I think on, on Wasatch Boulevard, the state, uh, the state road, that would be facilitated by UDOT. And I know right now they, they do require the full cost of those improvements to be borne by the applicant and not by UDOT. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, D, um, D states that the local jurisdiction should endeavor without material cost to have all permanent improvements above ground set back 30 feet from the existing right of way line or perpetual easement line to facilitate future widening. Uh, I, I am not comfortable with this. I, I think that is probably a provision UDOT um, should regulate. Um, it, and, and I would actually propose to, to remove this or, or change this in this agreement. I lost, Mike, have I lost you? Are you there? I heard you fine, Scott. You can't hear him? Yes. Okay. But he came back. It may have been my computer. Sorry. Okay. So anyway, Mike, you're talking yeah. or proposing so, that this item D be removed? I, I am. Um, I don't want to, uh, to, to convey that we're accommodating future widening without going through proper coordination with UDOT. And we've got a lot of strong language about this in the Wasatch Boulevard Master Plan. And further on private property, we have minimum setbacks. And, and I feel that um, if we do want to pursue something like this, we ought to change the setbacks of those properties rather than, uh, you know, I don't know that we can require uh, obstructions to, to not be constructed within 30 feet if our setback is, say, 20 feet. Have you, uh, presented, have you presented your concerns to them already? Have they responded? Th so this is a more recent draft. Um, we have, we've gone through very preliminary uh, back and forth, and and after this meeting, after the council's feedback, we will have another meeting, and I'll I'll convey that. Uh, and then E here identifies existing warranted or potential traffic signal locations. Again, these are already on record with UDOT. Uh, you'll see most of these exist already, but again, just formalizing this and putting it in writing. So we we anticipate, or we we have existing signals. You can see they're they're not highlighted. I won't spend time on that. You're all familiar with where the signals are along Wasatch. Uh, the two items where signals do not currently exist, one is in the gravel pit area. This is where we provided some feedback. Their original language is a lot more strict than it is here. Um, it states that one proposed signalized access to the gravel pits envisioned, and then two proposed unsignalized right-in, right-out intersections. However, we, we based on our um, collaboration with UDOT, they've added the language that the exact locations and options to signalize will remain flexible pending study and analyses, which gives us that flexibility as we consider that future development. And then number six is the other signal that is, is a, a potential but not existing today. It's the Kings Hill Drive intersection. Um, and as it's written here, there, there is potentially warrant for a signal at that location uh, on the condition that the cross street is aligned with Kings Hill and at least one warrant condition is met. I know this has been explored in the EIS and will continue to be. That's a very, uh, we get a lot of feedback on that intersection. Site visibility there is, is poor and, and it's not a, a safe turn at this time. Um, so so I, I think it's a good thing that a signal is at least uh, possible there uh, and, and maybe warranted. Uh, number seven here is the, the high T signal. There have been discussions with UDOT that this is not um, locking this into a high T configuration forever. This is just saying that intersection um, does warrant a traffic signal, whatever that may look like. Um, and then I, I think it, I felt it was important to highlight that in this document, all signalized intersections shall accommodate pedestrians for all movements. That again is key for our 
um, our planning purposes and, and we're glad that was included. Uh, the, the rest is very general language, so I'll stop there and, and open this up to any questions or feedback that the council has. And again, my intent is to take this back to UDOT, share the feedback with them and, and, and go through one more round. And I'd like to, um, to see UDOT get some internal uh, feedback and, and maybe approval of this document before it comes back to the council for final consideration. Are any feedback to, to Mike? He's, he's identified uh, two or three red flags that he'll take back to them and we'll have another chance to review it uh, before we uh, uh, have it as an action item. Any further comments or questions? Uh, I'll throw a couple comments or questions, Mike. Um, this is a, I, I assume this is a fairly standard document with our specific um, traffic signals included. Um, one of the things that I felt like it was important in the Wasatch Boulevard master plan was the notion of not increasing any kind of sound along the corridor with any of the improvements that they make. Is there, is there a way we can add a number 10 to this? Can we, can we tailor this to some of our needs or things that we included in the Wasatch Boulevard master plan so we codify it so it's not just in our plan but it's actually in this document? Yeah, I, I'm happy to push for those things. Um, if you have specific things, I know we do incorporate or reference the, the master plan, but, but I'm happy to push specific things um, as they relate to access management and signal spacing and things like that. Yeah, because I think, you know, I don't know what you're, you might have more experience than I do on this, but sometimes when you add additional lights, and I think about our canyons being used a lot for, for motorcycles, and at times, you know, when you add a you add a light and then you get people stopping and they hit the gas and they go boom right and and so I I just I think about that because I constantly hear that those those kinds of things from my house but I think if we can include anything in terms of sound here that would be great I also the high inter, high T intersection still causes causes me great concern um, on the merge there so I don't know if there's anything more that we can include here when they are adding deceleration or acceleration lanes and, and merges. I, I don't know, I just, I just wonder if there aren't some more specific, isn't more specific language that we can utilize as we think about the concerns that we have with the lights that they've, or crossings they've included to date and sort of the pitfalls that, because we, they create challenges for us and, and we get stuck with them for, for years thereafter. If we could figure out how to avoid those from the beginning, maybe that would be better. I'm sure, not sure yeah. I'm offering you any, any uh, great input here as to what you could include, but I guess that's when I look at this document, I think, okay, what have we learned from the past and how can we enhance this document so we avoid it from happening again in the future? So essentially some sort of flexibility with the, the signal design maybe um, and, and the opportunity, especially on number seven here, it's just written as an existing signal, but uh, perhaps some language to you know, assess the, the configuration of, of these intersections as circumstances change or as dictated or something like that? Yeah, I think so. Because even in front of the gravel pit, I saw something, didn't it say they would add one light, but there would be two right-hand turns that could come on to the corridor? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I just think about the, I don't know, I don't know why I keep thinking about the high T, but there's, when you have entrances like that and people coming at high speeds and people coming out, I just think, well, what's going to happen from a, a safety perspective? I just, and maybe Robbie knows, and his team knows, or uh, sorry, Chief, Chief Russo knows better than I do. But it just, it just seems like this is the kind of document that maybe we could try to pull in different departments and create something that enhances safety. So think about it and we yeah. can talk later. Okay, I'll right. think of some language. Maybe it's something like is written in number two. Um, just some flexibility pending you know, additional study or analysis or circumstance with safety in mind. I think things, agreements like this are opportunities to tweak that relationship and give us an opportunity to review. So I think those are excellent comments. I know, Mike, you keep referring it to a highway. And but yet I don't think an agreement refers to as a highway. Well, it does, segments of the highway. So is there a definition for highway? I know on the in the Wasatch Boulevard Master Plan, we more or less implied it was a boulevard. Does that, does that have any impact on an agreement like this? I, I think the language in here is referring back to this, this R930-6 document. 
um, where it, it actually calls these roads category three and category five facilities. And then those are defined in that document. Um, I, I don't know that it has any bearing on how the city defines this or the city visions this. It, it more just matches the language in UDOT's existing um, uh, rules and standards. Yeah. Okay, well, if you see an opportunity to clarify that, that's always good because sometimes to delay mm -hmm. a highway definitely has a different connotation than a boulevard. Sure. And the official yeah. title is Wasatch Boulevard, so. And our, and our master plan refers it to more as a boulevard with enhancements that uh, we just want to, anywhere, any way we can get those referenced, I think it's a plus, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I would echo that because I think about uh, the, the road that leaves, what is it, Ogden and I-15 heading towards the turnoff for, you know, up into the, the canyon towards Snow Basin there. That probably was considered a boulevard at one point. Now it's going to be a super highway which is great for those of us that want to go skiing in Snow Basin. And I'm sure many people want the same for Wasatch Boulevard that want to drive on it to get to Snowbird and Alta. But those of us that live here certainly don't want to have a highway. So I, I would hate like the, I would hate to think that they're including things like that in here. And, and that opens Pandora's box. So I appreciate you bringing that up with the mayor. Yeah, I would just echo what Council Member Michael and the mayor are saying on that. I think uh, that wording is really important. And, and that's in the where that's in the recital, right? Uh, whereas the first whereas one, I don't know where else it is. Yeah, state highway, a state highway primarily functions to move higher traffic. Yeah, I, I can work with them to, to change how that comes off. Yeah, at least the, the perception if it's not factual, but in the body, if we can reference anything else that would give us some uh, support for our position, it would be great. Okay. Any other comments or feedback to Mike? I did have one question. Um, the category three and category five, Mike, where exactly are those sections delineated or which, which section is which? Yeah, um, so, so they're not delineated in this document, but SR190 um, is a category three. Um, SR190, is, that runs from the 6200 South, the, the interstate interchange off of 215 in front of the gravel pit and then turns up Big Cottonwood Canyon. And then SR190 picks up from the Fort Union intersection of Wasatch Boulevard and goes all the way south into Little Cottonwood Canyon. So I may have misspoke, that's SR210. That's a category five. So category five is a, um, it anticipates, um, there is some flexibility you can see in this page here for private driveways. It's a lower capacity road than a category three. Okay, that's the category, the category five is more intense use, higher. No, the other way around. Category three okay. is more intense, five is less. So, so category one in their vernacular is probably a freeway or I-15, something yeah, like that. That's I-15, yeah. All right, any other comments? I think you've got some uh, feedback and appreciate having the opportunity to have the council uh, review and comment, so. Yeah, thank you. All right, moving on to item D. Uh, we have an item, Mike Johnson, you wanna do this one as well, exception to private roadway design requirements. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Page one here. All right, so this, this is a request that was made um, by an applicant for a, a modification or an exception to a, a private street standard that's found in Title 14 of our ordinance, which is the, the title of our city code that deals with public and private streets and roadways. For context, the, the subject property is here. This is just off of 7200 7, South. Just to the north, this, this slope up at the top here is a, a steep slope downward, and this is Santa Fe Apartments. Uh, so that kind of puts you uh, in context of where we are. So that's Councilman Peterson's uh, area. Yes. Uh, again, more context of the property today. This is an existing property with just one house on it. It's located at the end of a planned unit development. I believe this is Platinum Heights PUD. Um, the, in the last year, here's another visual. This is 
the existing private um, planned unit development into the subject property there. Uh, it's located in the R18 zone, as is much of the area around it. The, the RM zone adjacent to the north, like I said, is, is down a, a very steep slope. Uh, last year, I, I believe in 2019, it could have been 2018, um, a preliminary plat was approved by the Planning Commission uh, for a three lot subdivision. So essentially um, pulling in this lot at the end of uh, Treasure, Treasure Way, I believe, Treasure Ridge Circle. That, that's that. the circle? So the blue yeah, one? Is, that's the circle there. So the blue one accesses off of the circle and then the orange and the green one would access through that Platinum Heights PUD. So this preliminary plat has been approved um, for, for quite a while. The final plat has not yet been recorded. There are some outstanding um, civil matters that the, the applicant is working on. They don't affect this application, but that is the reason for the delay in the recordation of that plat. Again, here's the preliminary plat. As you can see, the access comes through this private street. It's called Hadley's View Drive, which is owned by the plan unit development, Platinum Heights there to the south. Um, and the private street comes up through, through the development and just kind of stubs into these two lots. Um, this private street will not access this third lot, this lot 301, that will be accessed by uh, Waymar Circle, I apologize. There are a number of constraints on this lot. Um, as I showed in the, the photos, there's a very steep slope to the back. So even though these are half acre or more in size, just over half an acre properties, the actual buildable space is much less. You've got the private roadway. And then to the south, you have this parcel A, which is a, a retention basin in favor of Platinum Heights. And that's where there's been some ongoing civil discussions um, between the two property owners on how to utilize that. Uh, on top of the steep slope, you have a couple easements that, um, that constrain a lot of the northern portion of these two lots. So the request has been made um, to vary the way we we measure setbacks off of private streets. Uh, the way the ordinance works right now, we have standard R18 setbacks that will apply. The R18 front setback is 25 feet. But in Title 14, we also have a provision that, that states for private streets, we have to measure setbacks in addition to measuring them 25 feet from the property line. If the property line is a private street, that the setback needs to be at least 50 feet from the, the center line of the private street. I think the intention of this is to avoid um, properties utilizing a private street as their property and then pushing their house very, very close to the road, which would create driveway issues and other things. Um, but it creates a, a few challenges here. So this is a, a, an illustration showing if this were a private or a public street stubbed into this property, how we would measure setbacks. You have the road on a, on a public street, you'd have a park strip and a sidewalk, and then you'd measure setbacks from the back of that sidewalk. You'd measure 25 feet back, and that would be your minimum setback. On a private street, uh, the way you measure, you have to meet 25 feet of setback, but again, you have to be 50 feet from the center line of the street. So we, we take this street, and in this case, this is just a little stub street, so it has not been required to have sidewalk on both sides, just on the south side. Uh, which is consistent with the PUD to the south. Uh, measuring from the center line of the street 50 feet actually creates a 35 foot setback from the edge of that right of way. Um, the requested exception here would be to, to provide a little more buildable area. These are not footprints of buildings, these are just buildable areas. Um, and reduce the, the 50 foot setback measurement down to 37 and a half feet. What that does is create a 23 foot setback from the edge of the curb. Now let's say this was a public, public street and the property line was here. We would measure setback from the back of the curb in this case because there is no sidewalk. Um, so right now they have 35 feet when other properties in the R18 zone only have to have a 25 foot setback. Uh, as we reviewed this, they're requesting a, a modification down to 23 feet. Staff felt that was probably a little too far. That is more than uh, what you could get on a, if this were a public street. Um, so we came back and, and, and made the recommendation to the Planning Commission that, you know, while there is merit for the setback reduction, we would request or, or suggest that it be reduced down to a 25 foot setback uh, instead of 23 feet. So then essentially the, the setback from that private roadway from the edge of the road matches exactly the same setback as any property in the R18 zone would need to meet. 
So again, here, here are our conclusions. Uh, I apologize if that was a little complex. There's, there's some weird ordinances uh, at play here, but the existing design of the road is, is very unlikely to be expanded to include sidewalk and a planter strip on the north side. Again, because it's just a stub street, there's sidewalk on the south, it's a private lane, it'll be privately owned and maintained. It'll never be a public street. Uh, there are site constraints that limit placement of the proposed homes further back on the lot. Uh, as I showed, there's easements and steep slopes. Um, and a limited exception to the building line distance from street center line will not be detrimental to the public safety or welfare. Uh, if we look at the uh, adjacent context here, let me get back to one with, uh, this is probably a good one. Uh, the impact to the existing homes on, on, in Platinum Estates there, or Platinum Heights, uh, is probably negligible because you've got this large retention basin plus a substantial private right-of-way, then you'd be measuring setback. There is no impact to the homes east of this because this is a side setback, those remain unchanged. Um, so just based on the way we measure setbacks, we feel it is reasonable to, to grant a, an exception, a setback exception, but not to the full amount requested, rather a, a, an exception to create a, essentially a 23 foot or a 25 foot setback from the private street, which would be a 39 and a half foot setback from the middle of the roadway rather than the 50 that is required. So again, staff's recommendation is on the screen here. Uh, the Planning Commission agreed with this recommendation and they voted to re recommend unanimous approval of the exception, again, following staff's, uh, staff's suggestion. Any questions on this one? Any uh, public comment at the Planning Commission on this request? There, there was one public comment. It was from the, the HOA president of Platinum Heights. Uh, the public comment again was more related to some of the ongoing civil matters. Um, you know, they're still working out legal access to the back lots um, and, and we will require that um, to be worked out civilly. It, it doesn't have a bearing on this process. However, in that public comment, they did say they don't, they are not opposed to this setback reduction. Mike, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. One goes to the one, uh, the circular kind of dead end. Are, are these, are the utilities and everything, are they hooked into separate areas on this? I know the grade's quite steep. How are they gonna do that? They will have to submit a full utility plan prior to construction. I, I don't know that we have that yet. And if we do, I, I don't know exactly what the answer is on how they're pulling utilities in. I know they have some easements here. This I believe is a sewer easement. Um, so, so they may be connecting through the back of the lots, but those are all details they'll need to work out. Uh, again, the, the, the setback reduction doesn't change that requirement. Um, but certainly they will need all those approvals from sewer and water and the other utilities before final approval. So they will be part of the PUD then? No, they will not. They, the, some of the ongoing debate between the two parties is, is they, you know, they just negotiating to what extent they, they pitch in on road maintenance or if they're legally required to or not. And there's a lot of legal background and context and history between the two property owners. Again, it's all civil matters that they'll just need to work out. I saw that lot when I was cam cam campaigning and I was surprised that it's been there for quite a number of years, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. But again, fundamentally, the, the staff's recommendation is based upon going from the 23 to 25 foot setback, which would be the same as a public street if you took the outside of a sidewalk. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Because we don't have a sidewalk here, the way it's measured we're not measuring from the, the right of way itself. The right of way is actually, yeah. you know, the midpoint of the right of way would be down to the south, so it wouldn't be quite as drastic. We're measuring from the street center line and where we don't have a park strip or sidewalk, the, it's creating essentially a, a, a 10 foot greater setback. Um, and, and there's not a you know, great reason that we can see to maintain that 35 foot setback rather than allow a 25 foot. So the compromise on the setback is really kind of met everyone's issues as far as that goes, Mike? Yeah, we weren't comfortable with 23 feet because then you're, you're almost uh, considering a variance rather than an exception. So 25 feet, again, matches what you would have to meet in any R18 zone property in the city. And this is set to be an exception for this particular location only. It's not generally to the code for anything else, correct? Correct, it will apply to lot 302 and 303.
and that's it. Anyone else have any questions? It seems pretty straightforward. Um, is that up for action tonight then? It is. Just making sure. All right, if there's no further discussion, uh, we'll move to the next item, which is agreement with Newman Construction for Scotty's Drive stormwater drain and waterway project. Matt, we'll turn it over to you. Yeah, Mayor and Council, you'll see this tonight is uh, for an approval for a contract. This is the Scottish Drive subdivision, if you'll recall. This was approved uh, last year during the uh, budget process for reconstruction in that neighborhood. And when we had the uh, big storm last year, um, we had some some flood damage in here. But at the time we decided the council approved an extra $180,000 to do work in this subdivision for the storm water. So this is part of that process. We're getting the storm drains uh, and the pipe put in as well as the new waterways on this contract and we'll come back later with the road construction around that. So it was bid publicly and uh, Newman was the low bid on it. You may describe what the work entails again. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I wish I don't have a picture up, I apologize. What it is, is we're increasing the pipe size in uh, Scottish Drive from uh, uh, 12 inch, uh, I mean an 18 inch up to a 24. We're adding uh, four, five inlets um, into the pipe and we're uh, improving the waterways. The waterway is, the, is really the concrete apron between two corners of an intersection. Instead of running the water underneath the road through a pipe, this just goes across the surface. We're widening those out and making them a little more shallow to carry more water um, through there. So it's, it's an underground project, everything that'll be going on in there. And there's okay. a 22, go ahead, Christine. Oh no, I, I was, had a different question. Keep going with your line of questioning. No, 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 I, I think I was just, uh, again, emphasizing the fact that it was bid out and we had three bidders and uh, Newman is 22,000 lower than the next lowest bid. That's correct. And the bids came in on the, engine, on the engineer's estimate. So we feel good about the numbers we've received and we're ready to move forward. I just had a question. You, you sparked a question when you said that this was approved in the last budget year, but we're just now going under, under to, to bid it and award it. So is that yeah, right? What this, is that right? It, what, last summer, I guess. Okay, so Scottish Drive, um, Scottish subdivision was approved for reconstruction uh, during the pro the budget process. Um, that was approved around July. Um, we didn't get the bids out the summer because that would have carried us into more into the winter. Um, so we decided we would go out in the spring so we can construct it during the spring and the summer of this this calendar year. Um, and obviously we got hit with uh, the first, uh, the end of April, March with the COVID issue going on. So we put things on hold after discussion with uh, Tim, we decided, and Scott, we decided we should move forward with this. So we're moving forward with the uh, uh, stormwater portion of it. Right, but the, the delay from say last summer to this summer didn't, didn't cause any issues with any no. kind of storm events? No, 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 not at all. The, uh, the storm event actually occurred after the budget was approved and we came for the reconstruction of the subdivision. We were already gonna be in there working on it and we came to the council after that event and talked about it and the council agreed and approved to the extra $180,000 while we were in there working on the uh, Scottish Drive subdivision. Got it, got it. And, and I have never heard of Newman. Have they, do they have a good, good record? And oh yeah, they've been, they've been around time. quite a while. I've worked with them in a couple of other municipalities. Um, they, they're, they're, a, they're a dirt firm. That's, this is what they do. This is their bread and butter. So feel good about it. Super, thanks. 
Thank you. Any further questions of Matt regarding that item? Again, it'll be on the, the business meeting agenda. Okay, hearing none, uh, we're gonna give you guys a break before the uh, work session, I mean, before the business meeting. Uh, the only item on uh, the agenda now is review of calendars and upcoming events. I think we, uh, I'm assuming that even though July 17th, 18th, Butlerville Days is pending, I think that uh, we can give instruction unless someone objects to Tim that we can uh, uh, have a, a news release showing that this event is being canceled uh, so that the people can plan uh, and everyone else can plan accordingly. Uh, I think the, the budget makes that pretty clear. Any, any discussion on that? Any concerns or questions? Mayor, if I may, we, we have prepared a draft um, press release on this, but I did want to get your input. Uh, we anticipated this in the budget process. We haven't officially um, declared that we're canceling it, but I, I, we are planning on it unless the council objects to that. I think it's critical we get it in our June newsletter mm -hmm. uh, so that our citizens are, are well aware. Um, there may be other minor activities that somehow take place in the city that we're not even sponsoring. I've heard of some of those, but um, I think it's important we communicate to, as Tally's often mentioned, to get the word out and let people know through social media and et cetera. Yeah, and if there's no objection, we, we're planning on a, a article in the newsletter. We'll do the press release very soon, probably in the next couple of days, um, unless there's any concerns with that, but that's our plan at this point. Okay. All right. Any other calendar items? It seems like, I guess there's not any. <laughs> uh, that being said, we do not have a closed session tonight. So um, what I would now entertain would be a motion to adjourn the work session and reconvene at seven o'clock for our business meeting. Move that we uh, adjourn this work session and reconvene the business meeting at uh, just prior to seven o'clock. Have a second. Second that. It's moved and seconded. All in favor can say aye or aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. All right, so we'll see you at seven o'clock. Have a nice little break. Is somebody providing dinner tonight? I didn't see it on the counter out here. No.